You said um, that you had seen other people misinterpreting Pope Francis or the bishop's words or actions. Uh, are there specific examples that have kind of hit the press and blown up, maybe blown up in the YouTube Catholic mm -hmm. sphere? Uh, YouTube sphere, YouTube <laughs> vlogosphere, I guess, uh, that you thought, yeah, here's a classic example of something being totally taken out of context. Yeah. yeah. In Amoris Laetitia, um, paragraph 297, it says something to the effect about um, it, it, it's contrary to the gospel to be condemned forever or something like that. Something along those lines. It's not exact quote, but it's paragraph 297. It's to that effect. Mm. Um, and some will say, well, see, he's denying hell. Right, because hell is being condemned forever, and here it's saying it's contrary to the gospel to be condemned forever, and mm. so therefore it's saying that there is no eternal hell. He's denying hell, and he has a false understanding of the gospel. You just read the previous paragraph, paragraph two ninety six. It's talking about how the church is not able to condemn someone forever. It is not the role of the church to condemn forever, but it is the role of the church to always offer forgiveness and mercy to make it available. Um, now, whether a person receives it or not, that's another issue, but um, it's nowhere saying that God can't condemn someone forever, which is the way they're interpreting it. It's saying the church is not going to condemn you forever for any sin that you've done. It's always going to make the sacrament of confession available to you. You're always able to come and confess your sins and to be restored to Catholic communion. You might have to do some penance, but that's mm. always available to you. I see. That's all it was saying. If you just read the immediate context, it's not denying the gospel. It's not saying you can't be condemned forever. It's not saying God can't condemn you forever. It's just saying the church isn't going to do that because that's not the purpose of the church. That's a one one example. And I just mm. thought, wow. And and that thing is still being circulated today. And, and so what I noticed is people will give this um, false judgment or a rash judgment. They'll fail to give the judgment of charity. They'll distort something intentionally or not. I don't know. Mm. That narrative will be created. And it will continue to circulate itself no matter how many times you bury it and show mm -hmm. that it's wrong. It will continue to circulate over and over and over and over and over. And whenever you have that just one time with just one area, more satitia, okay, that does some damage. But what happens <laughs> when you have a hundred things that the Pope has said that are being done this way? Mm. Now you have an entire paradigm being yes. formed and a person is now under the impression that the Pope is doing all of these things. So whenever somebody like me comes around and starts to question some of these details, they think, oh, you're just, you know, you're just coping or you just you're don't want to, you're a Pope splainer and you just don't want to recognize reality. What it is, is they built an entire paradigm on some things that are true, but a lot of things that aren't. And notice that I said some things are true. Some of these criticisms are legitimate. There are some things that I've heard some people say who engage in this mm -hmm. um, rash judgment I've heard them say some things that are true. So I'm not saying everything that you right. kind of hear from that camp is wrong, but a lot of it is. And whenever you start to chip away at it and question it, a lot of people in that camp don't want to hear it because they've already built this a huge paradigm yeah. and impression of Pope Francis based on all of these rash judgments. Right. So it can have the effect of what's sometimes called the shotgun fallacy, mm. where somebody throws out a ton of things at you, kind of like what happened in the set of a Kantism debate, right? Where there was this, we had way too long and way too many cross-examinations where Brother Diamond was able just to, what about this, what about this, what about this? Mm -hmm. Whereas like, even if there were a way to respond to every one mm -hmm. of these objections, you don't, you have no, you do not have the time to do no, it. No, there's no way. And so it just seems to mound up and you're like, well, look at this mountain and then look at what you've given and mm -hmm. it looks like you won. Yeah. And, and I've pointed out that a lot of the objections that were raised there were the are the same objections that I'm hearing being raised by Catholics who are not set of a contest. That's what's And I've been me. trying to call this out for a long time, saying a lot of this argumentation is the same argumentation that I hear non-Catholics using, and it really does lead you away from Catholicism. Yeah. And I think it shocked some people to see that a lot of their a hobby, or not hobby, but a lot of their favorite critiques that they use against Pope Francis were being <clears throat> used by a set of a contest. I think that that shocked some people to hear how similar they are in their criticisms of the Pope with a set of a contest. I think that confused some people. Mm. <laughs> and I've been trying to warn them, telling them this is where it leads. Thanks so much for watching. Please like if you liked and if you loved, subscribe.